Would I like to know I'm going to heaven when I die? Well, I hope so, but I don't know. I didn't think anyone could really know something like that. I guess that's something we'll know when the time comes. Sure, I think about life after death, but what can I do about it? Well, try to be good, I guess. More good than bad, hopefully. Life after death? I hope there's more than just what we know here, but it's frightening to think about it. I guess everybody is afraid of dying. It's eternity. I guess the question is, where will I be a thousand years from now? Now. 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 A thousand years from now. Think about it. My name is Jim Shetler. For the next few minutes, I would like you to think about where you will spend all of eternity. Does it sound foolish? Hardly. Someone once stated, the greatest truth that changed my life was when I realized I would live somewhere forever. But why is there so much confusion over eternity? Suppose you were wanting to visit a friend in another state. He gave you a road map to his home. But for some reason, you refused to follow it and as a result became confused and hopelessly lost. Whose fault would that be? Could you plead ignorance? Could you blame your friend? Of course not. He had given you a map. You chose to ignore it. In the same way, God has offered us a map to his home. Perfect instructions on how to live with him eternally in heaven. Sadly, many have chosen to ignore it as well. The Bible, God's Word, says God loves us and that God wants us to live with Him forever in heaven. However, the Bible is clear that in order to get to heaven, there must be a definite time in our life when a personal relationship is established with God. I was going through life like a lot of other people, not giving God or eternity much thought, even though I guess I believed in God. I had so much in my life to keep me busy, I didn't seem to have time to think of what would happen to me if I died, when I died. Well, I was very, uh, very confused. Uh, there's so many people out there that claim to have the truth, and the only exposure I had to religion, or so-called religion, was the weirdos you see on TV. What are you supposed to believe? I came from a very good family, and we attended church regularly. I felt I'd always been a good moral person, but I knew something was missing. The time came when I was finally shocked into reality. Half my life had passed, and I knew I wasn't prepared to meet God. For me, the turning point came when someone cared enough to sit down with me and open a Bible. I wanted to believe what I'd always been taught. I think we all do. But I found out what I'd been taught was not the truth. Someone showed me from the Bible that just believing in God, that He exists, wasn't enough. I needed a personal relationship with God. Hey, I'll tell you what made the difference. The Word of God. Someone took the time, opened the Bible, and showed me what it said. Someone opened a Bible. Why is this so important? Let's let God answer that question. God's Word says in 1 John 5, 13, These things have I written unto you, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. So we can know, and God wants us to know that we have this eternal life. By giving us the Bible, His Word, God has given us, as it were, a road map to clearly show us the way to heaven. But dear friend, do you know what the Bible says? If someone laid a Bible on your kitchen table, could you open it and find the parts that talk about how to get to heaven? Sadly, many people can't. Yet their eternal soul depends upon it. For God's word states, it's appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Let me ask you one more question, a question that I've asked many people before. If you were to die today and stand before God Almighty and God were to ask you, 
Why should I let you into my heaven? What would your answer be? That would have been a difficult question. I always thought I was a pretty good person. I tried to be religious and obey the commandments. I went to church and prayed every night. But even though I did all these things, deep down I knew it wasn't good enough. You know, I knew that I'd never done anything for God. My life was spent primarily living for myself. And in my own mind, I knew that there was no reason why God would let me into heaven. I guess I would have said that I was basically a pretty good guy. I mean, my thinking was, if you weighed my good deeds against my bad deeds, hopefully I could get into heaven. But then I learned from the Bible that nothing I could do could ever earn me heaven. I was doing the best I could to please God, but I was confronted with a question I couldn't answer. If I could get to heaven by being good, then why did Jesus have to die on the cross? A good question. Why did Jesus die on the cross? Because there was no other way. The Bible teaches repeatedly that sin requires a payment. And this is so important to understand. Let me illustrate. Suppose I had committed a crime. Having broken the law, I stood before a judge in his courtroom. The judge said, Sir, you've been found guilty of this crime. The penalty is $1,000 or 30 days in jail. Suppose I said, Your Honor, I admit I'm guilty, but I don't have a thousand dollars, and I surely don't want to go to jail. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Will you please forgive me? Now think about it. Would the judge forgive me? No. As judge, he is responsible to uphold the demands of the law according to the law. The penalty must be paid. So the bailiff handcuffs me and begins to lead me out of the courtroom to the jail. Just before I leave the courtroom, however, the judge shouts, Stop! Surprisingly, the judge stands, removes his robe, and lays it aside. Coming down to where I am, he says to me, Jim Shetler, as an honorable and a righteous judge, I had to find you guilty and require the penalty to be paid. I could not just let you go free, but as a compassionate friend, I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to pay your penalty for you. He then reaches into his wallet and pulls out a thousand dollars cash, holding it out to me. Pay the clerk, he says, and then you will be able to go free. Imagine the judge actually offers to pay my debt for me. Friend, this illustrates what God has done for you and me. The Bible says that God is the judge of all the earth. Each of us is guilty of breaking the law, God's law. The Bible declares in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In Ecclesiastes 7.20, for there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Most people, if they're honest, will admit that they are a sinner. But many are confused as how their sins can be forgiven. Remember our illustration, the earthly judge could not forgive me simply because I asked him to. He required a payment. In the Bible, we see illustrated over and over again that sin requires a payment, and that payment is death. Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. In the Bible, death means separation. God's Word says, your iniquities, your sins, have separated between you and your God. To die in this condition would mean eternal separation from God in hell. In the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 15, it says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The good news is that just like the earthly judge rose, laid aside his robe, came to where I was and paid my $1,000 penalty, God, in the person of Jesus Christ, rose from his heavenly throne and laid aside his robe of glory. 
He came to where I was, this earth, and lived a perfectly sinless life. He then paid in full the penalty for your sins and mine. How? By shedding his blood and dying on the cross for you and for me. The Bible says, but God commendeth. In other words, he demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He was then buried and rose again the third day, proving he was able to do what he promised. This is what we call the gospel. Christ died for your sins, but for you to be saved, there must be a time in your life when you actually, when you personally receive the Lord Jesus as your Savior, and by doing so, receive his payment for your sins. We saw Romans 6.23, which says, the wages of sin is death. Thankfully, the remainder of the verse states, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we see salvation is nothing that we can earn, but can only be received as a gift from God. I realized Christ and his payment on the cross was the answer. Just believing that he existed wasn't enough. I had to receive him as my savior. The decision was now mine. When someone shared with me from the scriptures that eternal life was not something I could earn through my church, but was a free gift because of Christ's payment for my sins, it was as though a light came on in my heart. It flooded me with joy. I mean, it just made sense. If I could get to heaven by cleaning up my own life, then why did Jesus have to die? No, Christ purchased my salvation with his own blood and offered to me eternal life, a free gift. Well, the choice was pretty clear. I could go on my merry way toward death and hell, or I could trust in Christ to do for me what he promised to do. I decided to trust Christ. I knew I had to make a decision. I decided to trust the scriptures and ask Christ to save me. I knew when I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ that he was what I wanted. Like so many others, I'd always believed in God, but I'd never received his son as my personal savior. I invited him into my heart and life. He saved me. He changed me. I set aside my pride. I confessed my guilt and he gave me eternal life. What an exchange. I only wish I'd known and received him sooner. You have heard from three of the millions throughout the centuries who have received as a free gift eternal life through Jesus Christ. You too can receive him right now. But remember, Receiving God's free gift of eternal life is not merely asking God to forgive your sins, it's receiving Christ's payment for your sins. It's not doing, it's receiving what Christ has already done. It's not a religion, it's a relationship with Jesus Christ. To summarize, it's as simple as A, B, C. A. Admit that you cannot live a good enough life, nor pay for your own sins. B, believe that Jesus shed his blood and died on the cross for your sins, and that he rose from the grave victoriously. And C, call upon him and ask him to save you now and give you the gift of eternal life. For God's word says in Romans 10, 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. So dear friend, if you honestly feel the need to receive Christ as your savior, that's God speaking to your heart, inviting you to do so right now. Would you pray this prayer with me to receive Christ as your savior and be assured of a home in heaven? Right now, pray with me. Lord Jesus, I admit that I am a sinner and cannot save myself. I believe that you died on the cross to pay the penalty 
for my sins and that you rose again from the grave. Right now, I call upon you and receive you as my personal Savior. Thank you for dying for me and saving me today as the Bible promises. In Jesus' name, amen. Dear friend, if you have understood and believed these important Bible truths, and if you sincerely prayed this prayer with me today, God's Word says you have eternal life. Don't trust your feelings, but rather trust God's promise. Our confidence is in the Word of God. The Bible says in John 1:12, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Please understand, Jesus died for you once for all. You only have to receive him as Savior once for all. 